Good afternoon. Welcome to Black Men and Dementia. My name is Carla Fields. I am a community outreach specialist at the Alzheimer's Association here in Northern California. This event is hosted by the Alzheimer's Association of Northern California and Northern Nevada. I want to thank you for joining us today and a special thank you to our program partners. Our program sponsors are Epsilon Beta Boule, Diablo Black Men's Group, Capital City Black Nurses Association, and the Bay Area Black Nurses Association. I'd like to go over some quick housekeeping rules for the webinar. Everyone is muted upon entry. We will have question and answer session at the end of the panel, but feel free to use the question and answer feature to enter your questions. Immediately following the question and answer session, we will have a special presentation on ways to reduce your dementia risk. So please stay on. Next, I would like to invite Board of Directors member Valerie Toller to give welcome and greetings from the Board of Directors of our Northern California and Northern Nevada chapter. Valerie? Hi, can you everybody hear me? Good afternoon. As a board member for the Alzheimer's of Northern California, I my passion for wanting to be on this board is, is twofold. One is to see the difference in Alzheimer's and to also advocate for a cure of Alzheimer's, but also because of my father, Burleigh Toller Sr. 14% of Amer African Americans that are 65 years and older have the highest prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. My father, Burleigh Toller, became one of those statistics in 2007. He uh, arrived in San Francisco, or the Bay Area, in 1947. And because his uncle uh, from Memphis, Tennessee, his uncle um, lived with his uncle, and um, his mother wanted, his parents wanted him to have a better education. As a result of that, he attended City College and then matriculated to University of California at San Francisco. And he, um, I'm sorry, University of San Francisco. And he was on the famous 51 Dons football team. They were uh, renowned because they were uh, invited to a bowl game, but because there were two African-American players on the team, my father and Ollie Batson, the, the, the team, uh, the, the bowl committee said that they could not attend. So unless they left the players at home and the, the team themselves collectively decided that they would not leave them at home. And so they didn't play. Um, he's a father. Um, he was a, um, a father, first and foremost, um, a husband, grandfather. Um, he was the first African-American toll taker on the uh, San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge. He was the first African-American uh, principal of the San Francisco Unified School District. And in 1965, he became the first um, NFL official, African-American NFL official, and then the first of any uh, sport in, the, in North America. Uh, my father um, lived a life of dignity, integrity, courage, compassion, and humility. And while living with Alzheimer's, this, and despite his all diagnosis, he did not devalue his character. He was gracious and a caring person, and he continued to do his best, and his best was good enough. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valerie. Your father was such a pillar and in the Bay Area community and nationwide. So thank you for sharing your story about your father. Next, I'd like thank to invite the representatives from our sponsoring organizations to say a few words in greeting. I'd like to um, welcome Mr. Spencer Tyrus, the sire archon of the Epsilon Beta Boule. Welcome, Mr. Tyrus. Welcome and thank you for, uh, for uh, inviting us here. We are honored that you have selected Epsilon Beta Boule, a member of Signify Phi fraternity, to be a proposal, promotional partner for the Alzheimer's Association African American Outreach for Black Men and Dementia web, webinar. Our members are excited and elated to endorse this worthy cause. As was stated, even though the emphasis is on Black men, Black women are diagnosed at a proportionally higher rate than other populations, which directly impact the number of Black men 
as caregiver in that role. My sister was diagnosed with dementia in her late 60s. Fortunately, she and her husband, my brother-in-law, had purchased a long-term health care plan that provided services at a member home facility a short distance from her home. Dementia impaired her memory, judgment, and other areas such that she couldn't stay at home by herself. Needless to say, after 55 years of marriage to her husband, this immensely affected her husband, her kids, siblings, my mother, and friends. When someone you know and grew up with and they had become a shining light in your family and community, it was very difficult to watch her deteriorate over a short period of time. She died at the age of 75 on her birthday in, on October 24, 2018. We're thankful and honored to be chosen as a partner with the uh, Alzheimer's Association. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Tyrus. That's a very touching story. And all of us at some point have someone we connect to who has a dementia diagnosis. Mr. Horace Gibson from the Diablo Black Men's Group. Can you um, say a few words? Welcome and thank you for your sponsorship. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for, for having us. It was a, a pleasure for us to team up with the uh, Alzheimer's Association. Um, with the Diablo Black Men's Group, one of our missions is community service. Um, we provide information to the community we want to partner with uh, great causes. And I can't think of uh, a, a worthier cause to partner up and bring um, attention to. Uh, like uh, Spencer, somebody in my family, my own mother uh, had Alzheimer's and uh, is what we call the, the, the long goodbye. You know, um, it's, it's uh, very hard to, to watch that and, and to experience that. And even within our group, um, our men's group, there are so many of our members that uh, have been um, in some way, like, like Carla had said, um, either they know someone or someone very close to them has uh, suffered this illness. And uh, it, it is an honor and a pleasure for the Diablo Black Men's Group to uh, represent and promote the Alzheimer's Association. All right. Well, thank you so much. And it, it's just unbelievable that so many of us are impacted. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. I'd next like to invite Mr. Carter Todd, uh, the president of the Capital City Black Nurses Association to say a few words. Mr. Todd. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining. My name is Carter Todd. I'm president of Capital City Black Nurses Association which is one of over a hundred local chapters of the National Black Nurses Association, which was established back in 1972. Uh, we are extremely grateful to uh, Ms. Carla Fields and the Alzheimer's Association for allowing us to partner and promote this great event. As caregivers, as patients, as advocates, we hold this very highly to our mission and vision, which is in line with the National Council I sit on for Black Men's Health. So we are really excited that this is taking place today. We're here to support in any way possible. I apologize, I'm at work as you see on the front lines here doing the thing, but uh, we really are just honored that we can sit here and support y'all in any way that we can. We look forward to the program, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Todd. And thank you for taking time uh, um, away from your work day to give your organization's greeting. We're very appreciative of your support. Next, I'm going to introduce our moderator for today, Reverend Quasi Thornell. I'm going to share his bio. It's quite distinguished. The Reverend Dr. Quasi Thornell was ordained an Episcopal priest in March 1973. He has worked actively in the church at all levels from leading congregations and as a member of multi-staff churches. He has served churches in urban centers across the nation, including being on the staffs of the Washington National Cathedral as canon missioner and the Interfaith Ecumenical Officer for the Episcopal Diocese of Washington and Canon Vicar at Christ Church Cathedral, Cincinnati, Ohio. In these ministries, he often served in a leadership position of nonprofit boards 
including the United Way, Urban League, and various church councils and other community organizations. Reverend Thornell has been on the faculty of the Church Divinity School of the Pacific as a teacher of pastoral theology and a counselor to the students of color. In 2007, Father Thornell helped to establish a school for low-income boys in Washington, D.C., the Bishop Walker School for Boys. His responsibility was running the day-to-day -day management of the school. Father Thornell has a Master of Divinity and Doctor of Ministry degree from the Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and an Associate's degree from the Mon Montgomery County Community College in Maryland in early childhood education. He is a trained counselor in addiction disorders and pastoral concerns. From 1982 to 1988, Father Thornell served as the vice president and the president of the National Union of Black Episcopalians. For the last five years, Father Thornell has been a volunteer with the Northern California Alzheimer's Association with special focus on the African-American community and faith communities. I can attest to that. He has been a wonderful champion for our organization. In, 2000, in June of 2020, Father Thornell was appointed to the Bishop's Deputy for Special Ministries in the Diocese of Southeast Florida. He now lives in Miami, Florida. We are so thankful that Father Thornell has continued to volunteer in the Northern California, Northern Nevada chapter. Father Thornell is married to Jacqueline and they have three children and six grandchildren. Thank you, Father Thornell, for all you do to support the mission of the Alzheimer's Association. I'm going to turn the program over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. It's a pleasure to be here and to be with everybody as we focus on this uh, very important issue that faces our community. I too wanna to give thanks to the sponsors of the program today because I think it's very important that we have community sponsors who can also help us spread the word. Um, last week, uh, Terry Carlisle hosted a similar panel discussion on black women in Alzheimer's. And she did a fantastic job and the panelists did a fantastic job. So we're gonna step up and show that the black men can also have a wonderful presentation on dealing with this most important topic that is before us today. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the Northern California Alzheimer's Association for addressing this very important issue. Uh, one of my goals and mission, and, and Carla can attest to that and so can Edie, is to really give more emphasis in all of our pro programs and dealing with black men with Alzheimer's because uh, as I looked around in my volunteer work, I noticed that most of the people who were doing the volunteers were women. And often the discussion was centered around women, but we need to really focus on also the number of men uh, who are impacted by Alzheimer's and other related dementia diseases. We have an outstanding panel uh, of presenters today and, and with the, uh, the wonderful technology of Zoom, uh, they come from all over the country. And so they're here today to give their expertise. So I'm gonna read some of their bios. They all have long and very impressive bios. Uh, I'm not gonna read the whole bios because uh, we have so much that we need to talk about. And I'm, I'm afraid we will run out of time if I just spent all the time reading their bios. But let me first introduce Carl V. Hill. Uh, he is the Chief Diversity and Equity Inclusion Officer for the National Alzheimer's Association, overseeing strategic initiatives to strengthen the association's outreach to all populations and providing communities with resources and support to address the Alzheimer's crisis. In his role, Dr. Hill is responsible for developing cross-functional partnerships with organizations to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as a result of his leadership, the association has broadened its reach to previously diverse communities with partners such as the African-American Episcopal Church and the Buddhist Tuschi Foundation. Within the association, Dr. Hill collaborates with human resources to attract talent 
and develop resources that champion staff diversity and a culture of inclusion. He authored an editorial in the Journal of New England Medicine, Neurology, highlighting the needs for more diverse perspectives to address disparities and pursue equity in dementia science. Dr. Hill previously serves as the association's vice president of scientific engagement. Prior to joining the association, he served as a director of the Office of Special Populations at the National Institute on Aging. Throughout Dr. Hill's six years in this role, he led the development of the NIA Health Disparities Research Framework, which stimulates studies focused on health disparities related to aging. He also directed the NIA Butler Williams Scholars Program, which provides yearly training for early career investigators interested in aging research. Our second panelist is Robert W. Turner. Robert Turner has a PhD and is an assistant professor in the Department of Clinical Research and Leadership. It's a secondary appointment in the Department of Neurology at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Science. He is a behavioral health disparities researcher with ethnographic and mixed method training. His current National Institute on Aging founded a K01 award examines the interrelationship between multiple measures of psychosocial and neurocognitive risk and protective factors associated with accelerated cognitive aging and mild traumatic brain injury and Alzheimer's disease and related dementias among further collegiate and professional football players. Additionally, he is the principal investigator on a study that explores whether the stress of being a primary caregiver or of a person with dementia produces cognitive dysfunction in adults and older adult black men. He's also the author of Not For Long, The Life and the Career of the NFL Athlete, and is a contributor on the LeBron James HBO document, Student Athlete. Our third presenter is Mr. Leon Carson. And Mr. Leon Carson brings a personal perspective to this discussion. Mr. Carson is a native of San Francisco and current resident of Sacramento, California. He has been a caregiver for the mother for not, his mother for nine years. Mr. Carson volunteers as an Alzheimer's Associate, Association community representative and has served as a planning committee member of the Alzheimer's Association African American Forum in Sacramento in 2019. Mr. Carson also participated in Alzheimer's Advocacy Day at the California State Capitol. He served as a member of the Alzheimer's Congressional Team for Congressional Congresswoman Doris, Doris Matsui and the Alzheimer's State Champion for California Assembly Member Kevin McCarthy. He also participates in the Alzheimer's Support Group when time permits. Mr. Carson is employed as an information technology specialist for the state of California. So you can see we have an outstanding um, panel and we will receive a great deal of information that will help us understand Alzheimer's and related dementia. So welcome everyone and welcome all the panelists. I'd like to start with a question to Dr. Hill. And Dr. Hill, would you please give us a definition of Alzheimer's uh, so we can all be on kind of the same place and related dementia diseases. And how does Alzheimer's impact the African American community in particular? Oh, that's a great question, <clears throat> Reverend Thornell. And, and thanks for that introduction. It's great to be here. And thanks to all of our supporters and our panelists, and uh, most importantly, all of our participants who took the time on a Saturday to join, really excited to, to, uh, to be a part of this discussion. So, you know, to answer the question, Alzheimer's uh, is a, a progressively fatal brain disease, okay? There's no, uh, currently, there's no uh, treatment that uh, affects the underlying processes of progression of that disease, right? So Alzheimer's is characterized by abnormal proteins in the brain, right? And this these, these abnormal proteins cause, you know, plaques. So the, the amyloid plaques, so plaques caused by, the, caused by the protein amyloid and tangles caused by the protein tau, right? So amyloid plaques, 
tall tangles in the brain, right, that form in areas that uh, influence uh, memories, right? So, so again, so, so three hallmarks, right? So amyloid plaques, tall tangles, uh, and that lead to what we call neurodegeneration or cell death in the brain, all right? So, so really important. So, so progressively fatal brain disease, uh, hallmarks of, of the disease, amyloid plaques, tall tangles, neurodegeneration. Interestingly enough, it, this is about black men and black history. This was all discovered by Dr. Alois Alzheimer's uh, who worked with uh, Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller, who was the first African-American psychiatrist um, uh, in the United States, had, had, uh, had moved with his family to, to Liberia. His family moved to Liberia, formerly uh, enslaved people. Um, he was born in Liberia, moved back to North Carolina um, and attended, um, an HBCU uh, in, in North Carolina and ended up going to uh, Boston University and, and being uh, graduating from medical school in 1897, having a real interest in research and um, ended up working with Dr. Alzheimer's to discover those hallmarks, right? So really, really interesting. So the second part of that question, Reverend Thornell was, you know, how does Alzheimer's relate to dementia? Okay, and so dementia is an umbrella term used for these symptoms, you know, around memory loss, right? And so there are different types of dementia, Alzheimer's being one of them, but Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia, okay? So there are different kinds of dementia. So you've got Lewy body dementia, and that's, uh, you know, characterized by another protein. So we, we talked about with Alzheimer's, amyloid and tau. So with Lewy bodies, there's alpha synuclein, right? And that's, that's a protein that, that, that uh, causes, uh, you know, this neurodegeneration in the brain that disrupts uh, things like memory, sleep, movement, and behavior, right? So Lewy body dementia is another type of dementia. And then you have frontal temporal dementia, right? And that's, a, that's the accumulation of the protein tau, so very similar to Alzheimer's, and TDP43, in areas of the brain that cause neurodegeneration. So we're talking about, you know, dementia and Alzheimer's are characterized by abnormal growth of proteins in the brain, right? And then, and then finally, there's vascular dementia, which I think is really interesting. And that's and when you compare that to Alzheimer's, which again, which happens when the brain's nerve cells and neurodegeneration, you know, happens, it breaks down the areas of the brain. Vascular dementia happens when key parts of the brain don't get enough blood that carry the the kind the, the, the blood with the oxygen and nutrients that it needs, right? And so, uh, vascular dementia uh, is related to you know life course issues, so, so things like stroke or hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol over the course of the li of, of of your lifetime can increase risk for vascular uh, dementia. So. Mixed dementia is, is pretty common. You can have Alzheimer's and another type of dementia, but dementia is an umbrella term, right? And so, so really interesting to think about from, from that. The third part of your question is, is around uh, African-American uh, African Black men and, and dementia. And so if we think about, the, 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 qu the quick answer is we don't know, okay? And I'll tell you, but I'll, but I'll begin to, to talk a little bit about what the prevalence could be for African American men in dementia. So, so today uh, we have we, we're in a situation right now where 6.2 uh, older adults, you know, people living people 65 years and over, are living with Alzheimer's, right? And by 2050, you know this number could rise up to nearly 13 million, right? So people are living longer, right? Two thirds of the people living with Alzheimer's are women. Right. OK, so two thirds of of, of, of that six point two million people with Alzheimer's are women. Right. And then African-Americans are twice as likely to die from Alzheimer's than white Americans. Right. And so there's a there's a disparity as it relates to Alzheimer's and other dementia that that uh, unfortunately disproportionately affects women and African-Americans. Right. And so. What we need uh, is more uh, robust data, more robust studies that um, include African-American men so that we can get a you know, real sense of what the prevalence 
is for African American men, right? And so some some ways to do that, I think, is to certainly enhance cultural competence among researchers so that we can get more African American men to participate in studies. Really, really important. I'm sure we'll talk about that. Uh, improve the diversity in the research enterprise and also in the healthcare system, right? So being sure that we have researchers uh, who, like Dr. Turner and others who we know are are, are champions in communities for including black men. Uh, and then going through this process of, you know, really engaging communities so that we can examine trust, talk about things like the Tuskegee syphilis study or, you know, Henrietta Lacks in Baltimore and, and, and come to some, some understanding about how, how awful they were, you know, bio, bioethic atrocities, but also come to some understanding about how important it is for, uh, in this particular case, black men to participate in clinical trials because we need the treatments to be, we need to know that the treatments are safe and effective in all communities, uh, particularly black Americans because African Americans are disproportionately affected, right? So they, the, the, you know, we are the population that we need to know the most about because we're most at risk, right? So, so really important. So, so the answer to that question is that we know that black American, black American men are part of uh, a, a population that's disproportionately affected, but because we don't have enough uh, uh, recruitment of African American men, Black American men in these studies, we don't have a true statistic, and that and that really links to our need to to uh, to better engage and work with communities so that we can we can do a, a better job at recruitment. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Following up on that, um, can you talk a little bit about the the since we as Dr. Hill said, we have no cure, and we really at this point don't know prevention, but are there some things that, that uh, predispose African Americans to get the disease of Alzheimer's in terms of, as we're looking at that, can you speak a little bit about that? Dr. Turner? Yes, I can. Um, and, and I really wanna just thank uh, Dr. Hill for you know, you know, setting it up like that. And you, know, you ask a really important question about predisposed, uh, but I would even say this, we, there are some things that we do know, but there are also many things that we don't know about being predisposed and what put black men at higher risk. Primarily because as he said before, the research that's been done in this area is uh, just overwhelmingly with white people, white women, uh, often, and then um, the the least group that's most likely to participate in the research, as we know, is our black people. But we, it's very difficult for us to get black men involved. But one, some of the things that you know we do know that put people at higher risk are um, things like the heart disease for the top ten causes of death for black men, which put them at greater risk in terms of health disparities heart disease, um, unintentional death, um, cerebr uh, cerebral cardiovascular disease. Um, you have lower, uh, chronic lower respiratory disease, your influenza and pneumonia. Those are issues. We also know that as far as for black men are concerned, um, we know that the risk factors that are involved that we can't change are things like age, family history, and believe it or not, even Down syndrome by middle age, people with Down syndrome, typically dementia, uh, develop Alzheimer's disease at a, at, a, at a higher um, rate. But there are plenty of things that Black men can do and that we know that work in terms of reducing our risk or, or lowering our risk of Alzheimer's disease. Things like diet and exercise. Research shows that a lack of exercise increases the risk for dementia. Um, and while we know that there are no specific diets to reduce dementia, research has also indicated that um, greater incidence of dementia on people who eat unhealthy diets compared to those who eat like a Mediterranean style diet that's rich in foods that produce whole grains, nuts, and seeds. Um, heavy alcohol use puts people at greater risk. Um, we know that if you drink large amounts of alcohol, you might have a, a greater risk for dementia. Some studies even show that moderate amounts of alcohol might have a, a protective effect. So, you know, we go back to, again, that Mediterranean diet, one glass of wine a day. But if we start to use overusing alcohol, it will put us at a, a, a greater risk, but we're not exactly sure. And even within that, we need to be able to recognize and understand the alcohol use, heavy alcohol use or any type of alcohol uses within our own particular community. 
One of the things I just mentioned earlier is the risk for cardiovascular disease, which includes high blood pressure, hypertension, high cholesterol, buildup of uh, fatty um, acids in your artery walls, um, obesity. Those are the types of things. We know that black men have higher rates of obesity. We know a lot of the different things that put us at greater risk are very much the same types of things that we've talked about. And we see that it made the news in terms of health disparities with COVID that puts us at a greater um, risk. And so we need to make sure that we do the things that the doctors have told us always. And that is, you know, you have to sleep, have to get really seven, eight hours of sleep every night. You have to have a very healthy diet and we need protective factors such as being physically active. Um, those are the same types of things that lower our cardiovascular um, rates of disease. It lowers our diabetes, keeps that down. It also um, being in charge of, this is something that we can do often is recognize about depression. Depression, there are, we've seen that there have been some links and some risks associated with depression and dementia. And oftentimes we may be hesitant to go and see um, mental health professionals when we're, if something is just not quite right. Uh, we get a greater risk because we don't, as men, we don't necessarily talk to one another. So we may not even know when we're slipping into some of these issues. But these are ways that we can, you know, again, we may be at higher risk in terms of disparities, but we can do things, you know, to set proper behavior in motion to guard against or catch things much earlier. Other things I would say is, again, sleep problems, smoking problems, and even vitamins and nutritional areas that put us at greater risk. So while we don't know a lot and we don't know how these things impact black men in particular, we certainly know that these positive health behaviors will protect us in many of the areas that put us at greater risk for Alzheimer's and dementia. And so we really wanna be able to study that, but we also wanna get the message out to our members of our community that these are important things that we need to do for our overall health, which will also be protective for our brain health. Okay, Dr. Turner and Dr. Hill, you outlined all the reasons why black men don't go to the doctors. <laughs> <laughs> because they're going to be told you got to exercise more, you got to give up your foods that you love the most, you got to stop drinking. I mean, we don't want to hear that, so we don't go to the doctors, and that's the basis of the problem, isn't it? You know, we, we hesitate to do that. <laughs> I, I would just say, though, it, you know, while it seems daunting, we are starting to see evidence where men are starting to talk to one another a little bit more. We're starting to see some positive things. And you know, sometimes maybe we even look to the younger generation pushing us to, to do a little bit better with ourselves. But so there is hope, even though it may sound dire that we don't do some of those things, we are starting to get the message through. And I'm just so grateful to be on panels like this, being with people like this, so that way we can see some of those positive traits start to trickle into our community. I know for a fact that the, the groups that are co-sponsoring this event today all have health initiatives as part of their programs. Uh, another group that is similar to that, the 100 Black Men of America has a very strong health initiative as part of its program. So they're all looking at the importance of health care uh, for Black men and for Black men to really get involved in dealing with their health concerns in a very positive way. There have been re recently two uh, important books that have come out about Alzheimer's and caregivers. Uh, one is by Dan Gatsby and B. Smith called Before I Forget. Another one is, by, is a novel uh, by Marita Golden, um, um, Love of uh, Circumference, The Circumference of Love. Uh, it's a very important book in terms of talking about caregiving. And uh, uh, Mr. Carson, Brother Carson, uh, you've had direct experience in terms of dealing with caregiving uh, with your mother. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, that experience and how that has challenged you and your family, perhaps? Um, well, it's been one of the biggest challenges of my life. Um, you know, first of all, it was difficult to diagnose. Um, the first thing that I heard about my mother, because I was living in Sacramento and she was in San Francisco, is that you know, there's something wrong with her. She's losing a lot of weight. Um, and it turned out that the weight loss had to do with her burning her food a lot. So she would 
cook burner food and she wasn't eating as much or as healthy as usual. Um, so, you know, just being distant from, from my mom, you know, she's since moved up here, but, um, you know, some of the other challenges I faced was uh, the role reversal. Um, you know, my mother was good enough to, you know, allow me to start paying her bills. Um, so when, you know, when I finally started looking into what's really going on, um, it kind of took a while, but we, we got the diagnosis of dementia and, um, you know, saw that the bills were stacking up and, and mail stacking up bills unpaid. So, uh, she let me start paying her bills. And in the process of doing that, you know, we went and, and allowed me to be a power of attorney for her affairs. So, um, you know, there were financial challenges, uh, role reversal of me now basically telling her yes and no on certain things. Um, found out that she was buying a lot of things like uh, the home shopping network type things um, and forgetting to, to pay the bills. And, and then some of the other challenges was dealing with um, telemarketers that, that weren't, you know, unscrupulous telemarketers. Mm -hmm. And then other things like family members, you know, I'm in Sacramento, I'm my mom's only child. And, She's, uh, you know, she's in San Francisco. Certain family members come by and and, and borrow money from her, and mm -hmm. and you know, had to had to kind of look out and protect her interests. So, those are some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, Doctor Hill, uh, you talk about uh, early diagnosis, the importance of early diagnosis. And I think Mr. Carter's and Mr. Carson is referring to that because the earlier you get an understanding, then you know how to deal with some of these uh, challenges that Mr. Carson is outlining for us. Can you speak a little bit about the importance of early diagnosis in dealing with Alzheimer's? Oh, Reverend Thornell, it is it's critical. And and thank you, Brother Carson, for your, your, your uh, your, your words there and, and, and certainly salute you as a caregiver uh, because uh, just the tremendous, you know, job that you're doing. And uh, it's just, just you know, it, it just really, really want to take a minute to salute you for, for what, what you're doing and what you've done. Um, yeah, early, early detection and diagnosis is so important. And I think this fits into, into how we're beginning to, to see, you know, the, you know, kind of the, the, the continuum of Alzheimer's and other dementia, right? And so, so you think about it this way: there's a, you know, there's a treatment that the FDA is considering right now that you know influences one of those underlying hallmarks that I mentioned before. So remember, we said you know, this is a disease about proteins. So there's a treatment right now that the FDA is considering where it would influence, reduce one of those proteins, right? And we're hopeful for a rigorous review. But we do know that this continuum of Alzheimer's and other dementia flows from, you know, being cognitively unimpaired to being malcognitively impaired to mal dementia to severe dementia, right? So, so this happens over time. So if we're able to slow that progression down, then we have a real shot at reducing new cases of dementia, right? And then in addition to that, if we're able to detect, you know, these proteins or abnormalities in the brain early enough in the disease process, then we really can enact what we might call lifestyle interventions to begin this process of slowing down the progression of the disease, right? And so Dr. Turner talked about all these cardiovascular factors that have shown to be related to, to dementia. Right. And so we put a pin in vascular dementia early on. Right. Because that spoke to the quality of the blood that flows to key areas of the brain. Right. And so if we're able to detect early in, the, in this continuum to say a person is at risk or you know, has a marker via blood test. 
right? So, so a biomarker is a, a blood test is a type of, of, of biomarker that's used for early detection. So if we can detect this early in the process, and then our, you know, our healthcare team, my doctor can say, well, now we need to do the work of controlling your blood pressure, your cholesterol, all the things that you said, Reverend Thornell, being sure that your diet is on point, right? Also being sure that you're managing stress, you know, because when we think a bit about lifestyle and health behavior, I don't think it operates independently. Uh, you know, I think sometimes we have work demands, we have family stress, Sometimes we're dealing with racial discrimination, right? Sometimes we're dealing with the stress of being a black man in this country, and that's real. And that leads us to maybe excessively use alcohol or to eat in ways that ends up being a coping strategy, right? So, so dealing with the underlying issues of why we might enact a certain lifestyle um, is, is important, but also being in the, in the care of a doctor so that we can know you know, this recipe of physical activity, um, uh, nutrition, and, and, you know, kind of dealing with stress, staying supported, staying stimulated is so critical and so important. So all of that is coming together, right? We're, we're, we're beginning to see this from, you know, a lens of some things that we can do to reduce our risk. I won't use the P word, not prevent, but if you can get an early diagnosis in the process, you can start doing some things to reduce your risk along this continuum of developing severe Alzheimer's or another dementia. Okay, Dr. Turner, um, one of the things that, you know, I, I've gotten in trouble in the past because I said black men are notorious for not going to the doctors as much. And, you know, they, they jumped on me about that. I, I really don't know why, but they did jump on me about that. But there is the difference between mental health and mental disease, right? And so it, part of why people don't talk about Alzheimer's as much is because of, of the association of it being a mental illness and not wanting to say that a relative, and maybe Mr. Carson uh, has experienced this, a relative is, is um, having some mental problems. Uh, Dr. Turner, can you speak to uh, maybe the stigma that might be related to um, someone experiencing a, uh, a decline in memory loss and ability to take care of oneself, especially amongst Black men? Sure. I, I mean, for one, that's a great question. And man, I tell you what, we could probably spend another two sessions on just this thing right here um, with stigma. You know, I, I'll start one place right up front and, and Leon, you know, he, he definitely touched upon some of this, but we did, we recently um, were here at, J, um, at George Washington University, the Department of Health in Washington DC uh, came to us and asked us to do a needs assessment around dementia in Washington area. And one of the things that we did in my group is we conducted focus groups with about, I believe it was about seven different groups of individuals. And we wanted to make sure that we overrepresented um, black folks, particularly in ward seven and eight here to understand kind of what their thoughts are and their understood, you know, their, their intentions around dementia. And one of the things that was very, very prevalent and that they asked for was that people who were providing care for a loved one in their home or a family member or ne next door neighbor, they really wanted us to work on delivering information, messaging, public service announcements about what dementia really is, Alzheimer's disease really is, demystifying this thing, debunking this. Because what they said, and some, something around what Leon had said, is that friends and families and neighbors that would come around when the person started displaying some kinds of cognitive impairment, you know, people just didn't know what it was, they got spooked, didn't know, know how to communicate about it, and they just stayed away. Well, that's part of some of the time, particularly for caregivers, is when you need the most help. You need the most support that you thought you could um, count on the people in your, in your social circle to help you get through this while you're trying to figure it out. One of the things that 
you know, goes on is that since we don't know, you know, don't know much about what's what's going on and we don't talk about it, maybe we didn't go to the doctors early enough to get an, a, 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 a diagnosis, to really get the literature, maybe go to the Alzheimer's Association's website and find where all of this information is. We operate under a cloud of mystery thinking that somehow or another, there's the same thing between say, for instance, um, a psychotic break and Alzheimer's disease when you're having ment you know, memory loss. Those things, you know, we need to understand how to demystify those things. The more that we understand what's going on, the more that we can be there to help someone, we can be sympathetic towards the families, the friends and the neighbors and that kind of stuff. And Dr. Thornton, um, Thornell, you, you mentioned one thing that's really important about this whole thing is where, with the research that I do is I really focus on positive mental health, brain health and behavior, right? And, and that helps us understand the difference between um, you know, mental health problem and a disease of which Alzheimer's is and uh, dementia is a disease. Just like other things, when we have other types of disease, we start to understand that there's a difference between the person that we love and, and the disease that they are suffering from. So mm -hmm. I just wanna say that you know, right up front, probably the most important thing we could do through this whole process is really to educate ourselves what's going on with the person who is suffering from the disease, what the needs of family members are that are trying to support that. Once we do that, once we arm ourselves, then we're, we're no, we, we really can put away the fear that may motivate us from keeping apart from other people and we can start stepping towards people to be able to help. Thank you. Brother Carson, what has been on your journey with your mother, what has been most helpful for you in terms of being a caregiver? Uh, what resources have you relied upon? Uh, uh, what has just helped you in terms of knowing how to move forward with supporting your mother? Uh, what, what was most helpful was going to presentations. Um, and, you know, the Alzheimer's Association would put on these monthly presentations with other groups. You know, they'd have um, a different issue every month, um, one on just medical things, another on uh, legal things, uh, finances, um, and just getting that information on a regular basis was helpful. Um, they talked about how to communicate. Uh, one of the big challenges early on was, you know, I had never been around anyone with Alzheimer's. I didn't know much about it. Some of the things that she would say just didn't make sense. Um, so I would try to reason with her and, and try to, you know, she would accuse people of certain things. She accused my uncle of taking her car. And so I would try to like convince her that it didn't, but I was all that was doing was just making it worse. Um, mm -hmm. So getting the education to, to, um, to understand, you know, like Dr. Turner was saying, what's the disease and what's, you know, is this the, is this the disease or is this my mother? Um, I had to just say, hey, that's the disease acting out. Yeah. Um, we would clash a lot yeah. and you know, and the circle got smaller, um, like what was mentioned earlier. Um, you know, my mother was a, a single black woman living in San Francisco, had a full life, had a big supportive group in her church. Uh, she has lots of siblings in the Bay Area. And slowly but surely, the circle got smaller. And, mm. you know, it was it was rough. It, I'm like, hey, how come people aren't looking out for mom? And and, you know, I would get angry. I would, you know, it was just a lot to take on. But these, the more I knew, the more it gave me confidence moving forward that I could, you know, care for her and, and give her the support that she needed. Um, so, yeah, support groups, uh, educational presentations. A lot of those presentations are you know, most of, most of the time I was the only black person there, mm. but you know, you have to do what you got to do to get that info. And it was definitely valuable information. Right. 
I know that my, my interest in terms of getting involved with Alzheimer's over probably over five years ago was because of my work within the church community and uh, learning of um, persons in my congregation who were suddenly impacted by Alzheimer's. And I began to look at how the faith community could be more supportive of persons with Alzheimer's because uh, as you say, Mr. Carson, we need to have those kind of support groups that will support not only the person with the disease, but the caregiver uh, who needs that support. Uh, Dr. Hill, can you talk about some of the resources that the Alzheimer's Association provides for people uh, with the disease and also for caregivers? Absolutely, Reverend Thornell, and, and I, I know we have great resources. Um, our chapter, you know, you know Carla Fields, uh, Edie Yao, who worked there in Northern California, Northern Nevada, uh, can provide, you know, specific information to care and support or education and awareness. Uh, our helpline is in the chat there, 800-272-3900. Um, but, I, but also, Reverend Thornell, I wanted to speak real quickly to this question I saw in the chat around how do we engage you know, black men for clinical trials. And, you know, I'm working with a researcher right there in Northern California. She's at the University of California, San Francisco. I'll be one minute. And her name is Dr. Elena Porticolone, right? And so she is really an expert in coalition building, right? And so when I talked about this process of building trust, we have to get our organizations, community-based organizations, national organizations, that champion the well-being of black men, of, 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 of black people. So that's fraternities, I think. There are a number of organizations that I think black men and communities trust, 100 black men, they trust and they, they take part in their activities. How can we begin or continue to, to develop coalitions of national and community-based organizations that can work with us in partnership with the Alzheimer's Association? All the people that are here today, you know, forget all the names. We're, we're concerned people who want to be sure that the, tri the, the treatments are safe and effective in our community. And today we're talking about black men. So how can we continue this discussion, right? It, 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 it's not just Black History Month. How can we continue this discussion with our partners so that more black men can join the discussion, understand the information and the resources, and ultimately participate in the trials, right? I, I think that's so critical and so important. It's a very good point because participating in the trials hopefully will lead to finding a cure for which we don't have for Alzheimer's at the present time. So there, there, there's a, uh, the Alzheimer's Association has these community education projects where they go into the community and educate different groups. And all anyone needs to do is to call the association and say, we need to, well, we can't do it now in COVID, but there are other ways to get that information out. And we can educate the community on all of the, all the areas that all of you have talked about. There's also a handout material, which is often very effective. There's also material that's in different languages. So we, uh, I know the association and probably Dr. Hill, because you are working in this and so much on the national level of trying to expand the information of uh, uh, resources to the African-American community. Absolutely, and Reverend Thornell, there's one other resource that we have I just want to mention quickly is our trial match. I just put the, 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 uh, the web address to trial match. This is like uh, a, you know, a matching dating service, except you're getting hooked up with a clinical yeah. trial, right? So you can go on there and see what trial might be uh, most relevant to uh, you know, conditions or in your geographic area. So alz.org backslash trial match. Again, there are many things that, that probably need to happen before anybody signs up for a trial, right? We have to continue these discussions, you know, but when we get to the point of considering signing up, or, and if you feel comfortable to do so, please visit our resource alz.org backslash trial match. Very important resource. And give that phone number, the hotline number again. Is, is 800-272-3900. My colleagues are available at all times. 1-800-272-3900. They, ne they, they never take time off. So they, they're available to answer questions, provide uh, more information, link you to our great staff in the chapters, people like Carla Fields and Edie Yao and others all over the country. So 
272-3900. And I've used that for brothers who are in California who have relatives in North Carolina that need help and they don't know who to call. And I can refer them to the office in North Carolina and they'll hook them up with resources right away. So it really is a blessing and a benefit. We can talk a long time because there's a lot of stuff that we haven't covered that we probably need to cover, but we have a limited amount of time and we want to provide some time for questions and answers. So I'm going to turn it back over to Carla, but I want to thank all of you brothers for stepping up and being present today and sharing this information on this very important uh, topic. But I want to just end my portion by saying you those who are impacted by Alzheimer's are related to dementia. You don't have to face it alone. There are resources available for you. There are support groups available for you. Uh, the faith community is working hard to get more engaged in dealing with this. So it's a hard journey, as, as Brother Carson was saying. It could be very trying on you as an individual to see your loved one deteriorate, but you don't have to go through that experience alone and the Alzheimer's Association is there for you. So please take advantage of these opportunities. Carla? All right. Well, thank you so much, Reverend Thornell. And I have to give Reverend Thornell the credit. He has been engaged as a volunteer and he has been telling me, Carla, we need programs specifically focused on the African-American men. Let's put a webinar together. We're working on getting out in barbershops wherever we can find black men, we are going to try to be there to share our information. Um, let's start with some of the questions in the, in the chat that I see coming through. What are the markers for men, for black men that are different than white men? How does, we talked a little bit about this, but how does stress impact that difference? Uh, you know, Carla, I'm going to jump in and take take this one because I think it's a wonderful, wonderful question and um, one that's that I'm working on, believe it or not. And I want to just kind of piggyback. I'm going to combine this question along with um, Bob Pranzer's question, just really piggybacking on what Dr. Hill said. You know, you would think that we would have an answer to understanding the markers of stress and how they impact Black men compared to white men. Um, but I spent the morning actually looking up literature to try to be able to understand some of this. And we really don't have studies that we can point to to say, this is what we know. I'm very fortunate that I have a study right now that's being funded by the National Institute of Aging that is allowing me to look at uh, black men who are caregivers, a primary caregiver of a person with dementia. We are doing um, taking cortisol uh, um, biomarkers to look at the stress, the physiological stress of being a black male caregiver compared to black men who don't provide care. So that's just, believe it or not, I was really surprised when I wrote that grant, you know, what was had come back to me is we don't have an answer to that because we've never actually studied this before in this population. And so I'm just going to tie it to that second question is, what can we do to encourage uh, black men to participate in studies? What I've found by going out into the community here is just simply asking black men, would you participate in the study? As simple as that sounds, many black men come to us and say, I've never been actually asked to be in a study. So that's the very first place to start. And then once we do that, we let them know how so many people who are making decisions about black men's health, there are not very many black men in the room. So we need to have black men in the room. We need to have data from black men. And once we start to tell them that this is about taking control over your own health outcomes, it seems to be from my responses that black men really start to respond to that and understand the importance of them being involved. So we hope to be able to answer these kinds of questions in the future as we get more black men involved in our studies. All right, we had one more question. Um, are there differences in the way dementia presents in men and women? I mean, it's a, that's a really good question. One that, you know, we need, you know, more data linking to what Dr. Turner said. I, I think the, you know, the symptoms for, you know, these various types of dementia, you know, you know, can vary by individual, by, by gender, you know, I, I mean, you know, there's just so much that we need to know around what we might call, um, 
um, uh, diverse perspectives in dementia, right? And so to, to be able to answer that question means that we've got more robust participation, you know? And so, uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned Lewy body dementia, frontal temporal dementia. I mentioned a number of, of signs and symptoms related to sleep and movement and behavior, uh, but we need more robust participation to answer that kind of question. So we need advocates, just like the folks here that are on the phone that are participating to help us get the word out about participating in this important research. And, and I would just jump real quick. One of the one other areas that I was really surprised when I was doing some of my literature review research to find out where black men are most vulnerable when it comes to Alzheimer's disease. We actually, black men, we fall at greater rates than anyone else, which means that we have the potential to hit our heads at greater rates, which would then create the onset, early onset of Alzheimer's and dementia. So just in that very fact, in terms of understanding why we fall more, what puts us at greater risk for that, and how we can protect against that would be something that I feel is very important for us to be able to get to and drive to the bottom of that. So that's just one little area that we know that we need to do something more about to understand that risk associated with dementia. Carla, okay. if I may, Carla, if I may. Yes. I, I think that uh, another very important point is that we talk about Alzheimer's just as an old person's disease, but they're younger. I mean, I, 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 you could, the doctors can correct me, but I think the, there's been persons who have um, shown signs of Alzheimer's in the early 50s. So it, it, it's not just an old person's disease like myself, it could be, you know, as, as younger persons. And also that people lifespan with Alzheimer's varies greatly too. Some people absolutely, absolutely. very quickly and some people can live for 20 years with it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Yeah, great, great variation in those signs and symptoms, Reverend Thornell, and we need to continue, uh, you know, we, this research field is moving forward at a rapid pace. You know, just in 2021, $3.1 billion set, you know, allocated for research at the federal level at Na the National Institutes of Health for this research. So there's more and more research that's gonna give us questions really because of the advocates with the Alzheimer's Association, you know, you know uh, uh, making that available. So, so we'll be able to answer those questions, which, which I think are really critical. And then going back to stress, which, which what Dr. Turner mentioned, you know, again, when, when, we, when we think about stroke, hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, you know, stress and coping go together. So there's, you know, people feel stress and they cope in a way, in a, in a behavioral capacity. And, and, and the ways that people cope are with substance abuse, many ways, but ways that could be unhealthy are substance abuse, nutrition, um, you know, all sorts of unhealthy coping behaviors and then not being able to get that physical activity in because of work demands, family demands, not making the time, all comes together to create a risk profile. I think that's you know, really intriguing for researchers to examine for black men over the life course, right? And I would have to input also the stress, you know, racial discrimination, the stress of being a black man in the United States, some of which you deal with on an interpersonal level and also on an institutional level, right? So racial discrimination as a stressor and coping in this, in this, in this uh, continuum is an interesting research question that, you know, folks like Dr. Turner, researchers in this field who are funded with those resources are really gonna give us some answers uh, to those questions. And, and, and I just gotta jump in real quick because it's just so good stuff. But earlier, Dr. Hill and Reverend uh, Thornell talked about the community um, participants, organizations that are out there to help, you know, really push forward this. And as you might be able to see, I have the NFL alumni shield on right now because we're working together here with the Northern uh, California chapter, as well as na nationwide, we want to raise the interest around this um, by, by, you know, utilizing the stature of the men that have played in the game. The other thing that I just want to encourage you all, if you know young people that are in school that are thinking about a career that they might want to follow, please encourage them that they can do Alzheimer's research while they're in college. They can start that early, right? And because we need more people that look like us to ask the questions that you are presenting so that way we can drive the agenda for our community. I've learned that if there's nothing else, if we're not in the room participating in the discussions, we don't get to be able to start addressing the questions that are important to us. 
All right. Well, I just want to add, Dr. Hill, can you tell us a little bit about that new partnership that's creating internships? And then we're going to have to end our panel discussion and move on. But all this interest, this tells us we need more programs and I'm going to work on continuing to offer these platforms. But Dr. T um, Hill, tell us a little bit about that new partnership. Oh, thanks, Carla. And Carla, thanks for all of your leadership here. We're looking forward to being able to come back and continue this discussion on, you know, not just Black History Month, but every other month and, and, as, and as much as possible. So thanks for your leadership with this. You know, exciting new partnership between the Alzheimer's Association and the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, right? So we've been talking about trust uh, and engaging communities. How do you engage African-American community so that we can recruit more black men into the studies. That, that, that's the high level. Well, we know that there are historically black colleges and universities all over the country. I'm a graduate of Morehouse College and Morehouse School of Medicine. And these have been anchors in communities in cities all over the country for the, the last century, the better part of more, more than a century, right? And so we're really excited about being able to offer internships to students from these HBCUs to work with our chapters and, and, and in working with the chapter, they can get experience in the, the, all of the things that our colleagues do with the association, but also help our association with engaging African-American communities, right? And so they, they have a, a, a year long internship program. And the hope is that they'll get so excited about the work and passionate about what needs to be done that they will uh, stay on with us and add to the diversity that we, we know we need within our association. And we know that we need to better engage uh, communities with, with their expertise and their energy. So you know, this internship uh, relationship with the Thurgood Marshall College Fund will kick off uh, this summer. So, so more to come And one of our sites actually is Los Angeles. So we'll, we'll be working with students from the uh, Charles Drew uh, Health Sciences University there, which is an HBCU and named after the, the you know, famous Dr. Charles Drew. So really excited about this, you know, just an additional opportunity to, to, uh, to increase diversity in our pursuit of health equity uh, for Alzheimer's and other dementia. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much. I'd like to thank Reverend Thornell as our moderator, Dr. Turner, Mr. Carson, and Dr. Hill as our expert panelists today. I hope that you've gleaned a lot of good information from what they've shared with us. And please stay on for ways to reduce your risk, healthy living for brain and body, but stay tuned. I send out a newsletter and make sure you're opting in for our mailings so we can get that important information to you. We'll be sending out a survey and a recording of this program, but stay tuned for the second part but thank you to our panelists and our moderator for joining us today. I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Epsilon Beta Boule, Diablo Black Men's Group, Capital City Black Nurses Association, and the Bay Area Black Nurses Association. All of our community partners help us serve the community in a much broader way. We are always looking for more partners more community supporters. So reach out to me. I put my information in the chat. You can find me at kdfields at alz.org or my phone number is in the chat, but you can always call the 1-800 number if you, if you need to reach me. Um, we are looking forward to working together to knock this disease out of our community and inform everyone so they know how to handle it if it affects their family. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you panelists. Stay tuned. I'm going to switch over and start sharing my screen for healthy living for brain and body. Let's do what we can to reduce that risk of developing dementia. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, there you go. Healthy living for brain and body. This is tips for the most current research available. When we, we heard Dr. Turner mention some of the things that you can do 
to reduce your risk of developing dementia. And we want to do all we can. I know dementia runs in my family as a personal connection. My mother has been diagnosed with vascular dementia. So I'm especially interested in what can I do to minimize my risk of developing dementia? I'm gonna share with you some strategies in the following areas, physical health and exercise, diet, nutrition, cognitive activity, and social engagement. Finding out through research is that your lifestyle choices can impact how you, how your brain ages, and excuse me, I'm going to move how your brain ages so that you can minimize your risk for dementia. The brain is the control center of the body. There are a hundred billion nerve cells or neurons creating a branching network. Signals travel through the brain and form memories, thoughts, and feelings. And Alzheimer's destroys brain cells. The heart and brain are interrelated. We have a saying, heart health is brain health. So whatever you're doing for your heart, is you're doing it to your brain. So protecting your heart is protecting your brain. And the brain needs blood flow. The brain depends on oxygen and adequate blood flow to work well. And 25% of blood from every heartbeat goes to the brain. We know that dementia is caused by many different diseases and conditions. It is not a normal part of aging. And Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. Known risk for Alzheimer's include age, genetics, head injury, cardiovascular factors, and fewer years of formal education. And therapies for Alzheimer's can treat symptoms, but cannot cure, prevent, or even slow the disease progression. The first area we're going to talk about is physical health and exercise. Physical health and exercise makes can can may well may reduce your risk of cognitive decline regular and vigorous exercise leads to increased blood flow and other physical activities may also yield benefits and i know from a, just anecdotally when on the days that i can take my mom for a walk she has better days she, her speech is much more detailed her understanding of what's going on and even the retention of information is much deeper. So I think there is definitely something to that. And there are a lot of studies going on, particularly in Northern California. We have the use um, at UC Davis, there's the US Pointer Study, which is a lifestyle intervention study that looks at what levels of intensity do you need to exercise to minimize risk? is that even people with a diagnosis can, can slow the disease progression. So look at how you can implement more exercise in your life. I'm going to skip this video. I, I don't think we're going to have clear, clarity on it, but this gentleman, Woodley, is sharing that just get started a little bit every day helps, helps you develop a pattern and also little bits help, even if you're breaking it up during the day, 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, and 10 minutes later on, we can all do a little bit of 10 minute recess. And that's what I try to do now that we're all working at home or in a different set, no matter where you're working, take little breaks, get up and walk around. Being sedentary is the new smoking. So we wanna keep moving. And do something that you like, start out small, move safely, get your heart rate up. You don't have to be dripping. The research is showing you just need to glow. So a little bit of glow is just all you need to get moving. Now you can build up and even improve your cardiovascular function, which is improving how much blood is flowing to your brain, but start at a safe level. Talk to your doctor before you start something new. 
but just do something. And we know that we need to stop smoking, avoid excess alcohol, get adequate sleep. The, a lot of the research is showing that when you're sleeping in that deep REM sleep is when your brain is clearing out those plaques. So treat sleep as a, or lack of sleep as a medical condition that you wanna get on top of. Avoid head injury, protect your head when you're engaging in sporting activities, manage your stress. You know, our panel of experts just told us about the impact on stress um, on black men, on, on black women, all around stress can have, um, have an impact on your brain function. Treat depression, talk to someone, get that help that you need and, and make sure you're visiting your doctor regularly. And know your numbers. The numbers you should know are your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your weight and cholesterol. Those are the numbers when you go in for your annual physical and I hope you're getting your annual physical. And just on a side note, if you're on Medicare, you can be asking your physician for a, um, a dementia screening at every annual physical. So take advantage so you can kind of have a baseline to know how you're doing. Um, you want to know those numbers, pay attention to that, that report you get from your blood work, read it, ask your doctor about it. If something's looking a little higher than before, you want to make sure that you're getting on top of that. Next is diet and nutrition. You know, what's good for your heart may also be good for the brain, but nutritious food is fuel for your brain. So you want to look at what am I putting into my body? And is it good for my body? We know that some of the dietary um, guidelines can reduce your risk for heart disease, cancer and Parkinson's, and also Alzheimer's disease, stroke and diabetes. As you see, there are some continuing themes coming up here that those, um, those diseases such as heart disease, the cancer, the Parkinson's, stroke and diabetes, they can be related to developing Alzheimer's and dementia, but our diet is influencing all of those things. Everything is coming back to be interrelated. I'm going to skip our videos. Um, what Dr. Morris was talking about was that, you know, we talk about the Mediterranean diet, but I wanna share with you any diet, any cultural diet where you look at, am I getting good, you know, unprocessed foods, um, leafy green vegetables, fruits, nuts, beans, and whole grains, lean meats, fish, and poultry, and um, using vegetable oils for preparation. Those are the components that could be the Mediterranean diet. That could be the African-American cultural diet. It's really by the choices of what you, how you prepare the foods that are in your diet. And we all know, like if you have a grandmother who had a, a garden, the okra, the collard greens, the peppers, all of those vegetables are good for your heart. They are good for your brain. So think about your diet choices and how can you prepare them in the, um, in, in the healthiest way. You know, you want to avoid the saturated and trans fats. Look at those labels on the back of those foods you're purchasing. Processed foods, we want to limit that. Solid fat, sugar and salt, we all know about the correlation between salt and high blood pressure. So take a look at that and minimize that to the best of your ability. Deep frying, you know, I love my air fryer now and I never thought I would but the air fryer can crisp up whatever you wanted to crisp up before in a pan of oil, you can get an air fryer and get that same texture and same flavor without the heart clogging fat. And we don't want that heart clogging fat because that's clogging up your brain too. And, you know, and limit the fast foods and make healthier choices if you do have to eat fast food. And always consult a reputable source if you're taking dietary supplements or vitamins, you want to talk that over with your doctor. Cognitive activity. You know, I, I do puzzles with my mother. She does word searches, word finds, crossword puzzles, Sudoku, you know, even watching television. 
you know, my mom loves to watch Jeopardy. That's kind of our evening routine. But as we talk and see if we can figure out the answer, you're utilizing your brain. You're getting that exercise for your brain. So you want to keep in mind, keep your mind active, forming new connections around brain cells. So you want to be learning new things and you want to exercise your brain every day. We have expectations of our children to be learning something new every day. That expectation should not stop when we become adults. Cognitive activity encourages brain flow to the brain. Um, you know, I was working on a puzzle this week. It was kind of hard. I could tell I was really thinking because my head was starting to hurt. But doing those things that really form a, a mental cognitive challenge are good. Continue to play an instrument, music and the correlation between music and dementia. It's wonderful. Music can stimulate memories. And you want to continue to play an instrument, expose your loved ones to music. It's all good for the brain. Um, engaging in formal education will help keep your brain healthy. That means learning, you know, learning something new, continuing to learn, reading, attending lectures, doing this. You're learning something new today. Continue to challenge your brain. Let me skip this. But there are things that you can do. And I mentioned the puzzles, playing games. You know, it's interesting during the pandemic, we were all kind of locked in. And, you know, finally I told my daughter, like, you need to get a hobby. You can't sit around and be on YouTube, watching YouTube when you're not doing schoolwork. You need to, you know, in addition to like, let's get outside and go for a walk, but start doing something, start making something, start being creative with your mind. And, and it doesn't have to be anything complex. And, you know, there's things I do, even I play little mind games when I'm driving. I try to memorize the license plate in the car in front of me if I'm at a stop sign. Or I play a little game. We, we play like, you know, um, not Where's Waldo, but I Spy. Those are good games. You don't have to call it I Spy, but you're still doing, you're observing your surroundings and memorizing activity, memorizing information. And that is good. There's so many sources of free classes out there through look get a library card if you have a library card use it a lot of um, colleges and universities are offering free online courses and you can you can sit in those courses and hear that information stretch your mind take it all in so really take a look at what's out there what can I do there's many opportunities even our senior centers our senior centers may have virtual programs they may have dial-in programs. You can take advantage of listening in to activities and having conversations, Eat, talking with someone on a regular basis. That's good for your brain. So um, the isolation that seniors are feeling during COVID, we need to get on the phone, old school, talk to people, call them up, just say, hey, I was thinking about you. What are you doing today? That is brain activity. I make sure my mom is talking to her friends on a regular basis on a phone call and we do Zooms and she's gotten adapted. We've all gotten adapted to Zooms, but those are good because you're engaging socially, you're talking, you're stimulating conversation, and that is all good for the brain. Social engagement, that's the perfect tie-in. And social engagement is associated with living longer with fewer disabilities. You know, think about if you're involved in a faith-based organization or a club, those seniors who are all in, they're the ones running the show and they are thriving. And it's so important to stay busy and stay, you know, stay cognitively um, involved. So staying engaged in the community offers you an opportunity to maintain your skills. Remaining both socially and mentally active may support brain health and possibly delay the onset of dementia. So do what you can. If you're in a club, stay involved. Visiting with family and friends. We may not be able to do it in person, but that's where that telephone comes in. Old school, get on the landline. If you got a cell phone, get on your cell phone, but reach out and talk to people. And just engaging with others, talking to your neighbors. You can sit socially distanced, 
and, and talk, but offer your skills in your community. We at the Alzheimer's Association always need volunteers. We encourage people, get involved with us. It's a wonderful way to give back. You are impacting our ability to serve more people by volunteering. And there's a place at the table for everyone. We have all kinds of opportunities. If you like to talk, we're training community educators. You can share presentations such as this one out in your community. If you're a, a former teacher, former nurse, there's no restriction. If you like to talk, you can become a community educator. Uh, we have other roles. We have advocacy roles. If you want to be a part of making policy changes that improve the lives for families who are impacted by dementia, consider being an advocacy volunteer. We have volunteer opportunities with the Walk to End Alzheimer's. You can help us organize walks. You can be on a committee, recruit people to participate, we go, you know, help us connect with our sponsors. There's so many different roles in walk. And the same with volunteer to be involved with Longest Day. If you're someone who likes to plan activities, that's a great way to help us, you know, raise funds for the support, for the support um, services that we offer. Get involved and through the Alzheimer's Association is a wonderful way or find somewhere that you are passionate about and you wanna give back. And so we know that to take care of your health, you need to get moving, you need to eat right and keep your mind active and stay connected with others. So combining all four of those will help achieve maximum benefits and that you can you know, start today by doing something. You've already started today because you sat and listened to a panel discussion and that got you thinking and you learned new information. But start small, build and grow do what you enjoy, and stick with it. You know, make those healthy choices. We've, we we're all have gotten information about the healthy food choices, and your body will tell you too. And make a plan. And, and then get others around you to support you and do it with you. And have fun doing it. And, in, you know, think about if it's too good to be true, it's probably not. Just use your best judgment if you're, you know, hearing about different supplements or different things. You want to talk to your physician first about before you start taking any supplements. But be cautious when you hear huge promises or reports of miracle cures, you know, um, you want to do your research and here at the Alzheimer's Association, we only stand behind things that have gone through the proper clinical process. And if it, you know, uh, any kind of drug supplement that needs to be FDA approved has gone through the proper research protocols to know that it's been tested on a large enough population and those outcomes are consistent and the same. It's very important because there are a lot of products out there that have not gone through that rigorous testing. And before you invest in something like that, you want to know that it has gone through the proper clinical protocols before you invest in it. And always, you know, you can consult with a, tr a trusted, reputable professional, your doctor is a good starting point, your pharmacist, or even the Alzheimer's Association. And here are the resources that we have available. And we definitely want to stress, you know, ALZ.org, that is our website. There is a lot of information on there. You may have to take it in chunks, but get familiar with it because we have the Alzheimer's Navigator. Um, that's for, you know, finding care resources. The Community Resource Finder will help you find resources in your community. And what's great about our resources they're nationwide. No matter where you live, we can connect you to the resources to help your family. There's ALZ Connected, Alzheimer's and Dementia Caregiver Center. So there's resources of support on our website for people with a diagnosis and for their family, their care partners, and their caregivers. It's a, a wonderful tool that gives you a lot of information. 
And you can also call the 1-800 number at 272-3900. That is available 24-7. It's called a helpline, but I also call it the information line. Because if you just need some info and you want to make a call and get that, that's a wonderful starting point. You can have a family care consultation. If your family is trying to figure out what you're going to do with a loved one that you need to figure out a care plan for, that's a good place. That's a good number to call. They'll do an asset and like an intake assessment over the phone and figure out kind of where that person is right now in their dementia journey and help you come up with a plan and pull in all those different members of the family. You can do a, you know, a conference call to get all the concerned partners involved, but it's a really good resource. And I know sometimes we have folks like, I don't need no help. I, I got this. I'm in control. Well, be in control and get the knowledge that you need to best help your family. And then, you know, we offer support groups. We're um, building a more, more support groups. You know, even in North Oakland, we have a predominant, we have an African-American support group and we have African-Americans who lead support groups. So there are many resources out there available that are, you know, that are culturally relevant to the people who want to participate. And you know what? Take advantage of that. I attended, I shadowed a support group thinking that I was just shadowing from work. That was a great day because I got to hear and, and, you know, hear information that was helpful for me and the journey that my family's taking. And it really kind of changed my perception. Support groups are wonderful. It's a great place to talk. You learn that you are not alone. And that in itself is, can help reduce stress when you know that you are not the only person out there in the world who's dealing with some of these issues. And there's people out there who can be supportive and share what they've found successful and guide, help guide you through the process and just share that information with you. And any of our classes, you can watch them online. You can watch a recording of this, Healthy Living for Brain and Body, through our website at training.alz.org. So if you want to tell someone in your family, like, hey, you need to see this, you can share with them our website and say, go to the training section and watch that video. Other videos to learn more about just the overall understanding of Alzheimer's is called Alt Understanding Alzheimer's and Dementia. And then there's the 10 warning signs. And we have so many more courses, Dementia Conversations. But you can also go through your local chapter because we are offering all of these programs virtually and you can watch them. And there's a, a, a community educator sharing the information and we'll be able to do um, get you answers to some of your questions. But if you have big questions, call the call the 1-800 number. And, and that can be an immediate resource of information to help you through a situation or just give you the information. But I want to thank everyone for staying on to hear our presentation of healthy living for brain and body and learning how to reduce your dementia risk. Because for what we know and our community being so impacted, we all want to get that information and do what we can to minimize our risk and hopefully lower those numbers of African-Americans who are being diagnosed with dementia. But no, you can start small, start today, and every, every little step is a step in the right direction. So thank you for joining us today. P um, please make sure you're opting in for mailings or else we won't be able to send you flyers to let you know about upcoming programs. I'm going to be sending out the recording of today's program. I wanna make sure that you get it. And then we'll be sending out more information about future programs. We have an African-American newsletter that I send out monthly. So you wanna make sure you're getting all the information. Thank you again for joining us and I look forward to seeing you again in the future. Have a good day, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Bye-bye.